We'll be in the book of Daniel, actually. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. And I'll just read a portion of this chapter, uh, beginning in verse 26. Daniel chapter 2. And beginning in verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king? But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days thy dream and the visions of thy head upon the bed. Thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed what should come to pass hereafter. And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, <clears throat> but for their sakes, that shall make known the interpretation to the king, that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Thou, O king, sawest to behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, and his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his sides of brass. His legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut off without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. And we'll stop there. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your love to us. Mercy and grace and watch care over us. I thank thee, our Father, for allowing us the privilege of coming into the house of the Lord. Thank thee, our Lord, for allowing us this great time of fellowship that we've been able to have and to enjoy. And for knowing, Lord, that Thou changest not, that You are with us. And Lord, I thank You for this church and for her members. And Father, I pray that in everything we do, we bring honor and glory to our King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. I ask, Father, that You be with me this afternoon as I serve. And may You give me liberty and ability to present Thy word in truth and in love. Forgive us of our sins. May thy will be done. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I think you may be seated. <clears throat> All right. So, um, I actually, I had written that we were on number five of our things to come uh, messages, but it really it's only uh, number four. And so, I know we've had a couple of weeks off, and then I do something kind of strange, and I turn to... Uh, Daniel chapter 2, and how does that relate, and what are we talking about, and, and what's going on. So um, let me give you a very quick, very quick summary of what we have done, and then uh, we'll get into uh, some of the message here uh, this afternoon, the Lord willing, if, if possible. But So um, just before I left, or not long before I left, we began a series of messages in the afternoon on things to come. And we wanted to talk and take it in bites, right? And so you might remember that's what we did for the first couple of weeks. I called it bite number one, bite number two, um, as we go through uh, this series of messages on things to come. And so the first bite that we took are things that we can absolutely know, that we can know surely from the Word of God. And, and one of those is that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, said that He would come back, and we can know that. And um, we, we can know those things about the Lord, you know, and His coming. We can know that He said that He would. We can know that He said He would come back by Old Testament doctrine, that His coming back would be sensational, and that it is near. Uh, then our second bite is that we cannot know the exact time. We don't know the exact time, but we just know that His return 
is intimate, that it can happen at any time. I then wanted to go over the order of the end time events, and I gave some handouts and some copies. You know, we went through that, and, and you know, we turned to the scriptures, and we, you know, we certainly we took our time through that, but the order of those end time events, right? That the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is intimate. It could happen at any time. It could happen before I finish this message. Um, you know, that first phase, that rapture, if you will. And then, you know, then there will be the time of the tribulation. And then we will come back and the Lord Jesus Christ, or we will come back with him and the Lord Jesus Christ will rule and, and reign. Boy, I just kind of... So anyway, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ or the rapture. And then the next event is the time of tribulation. Um... And then when that tribulation is taking place, um, our, our uh, you know, casting of crowns and our own you know, judgment, not judgment of sin, but judgment of service will be taking place in heaven. And then finally, the uh, marriage of the Lamb will take place uh, there in Revelation 19. Then at the end of that tribulation, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ will uh, return to the earth. He will destroy the Antichrist. He will judge the nations and he will reign on the earth for a thousand years. And after that thousand years, Satan will be loose for just a season. The judgment of the wicked will occur. And then that eternal ages will begin. So that is a very big overview. A uh, very, very high level overview um, in the order of the events of the times to come. In the third message, we asked the question, are we in the last days? And we went through that and... You know, we talked about the things that shall come in the last days that were given to us there in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. And the things that people fall away from, right? And then in 2 Timothy, we went over and we talked about the perilous times that we are in. And then the importance of preaching the gospel. Uh, certainly, uh, that was on my mind as I was thinking about the unchangeable God uh, this morning. So that kind of tells you what we were, were, what we have done very, very quickly. Of course, those were, um, you know, three full messages and, um, you know, spending the time in that. So <clears throat> that brings us to wanting to look at things, or if you do or not, again, my, my study on things to come is not just going to be structured uh, from the book of Revelation. There are a lot of prophecies, there are a lot of things that were spoken about in the Old Testament that related even to the latter days, as we read in, Nef in, in Daniel chapter 2, to the latter days. So there are things that were talked about in Daniel, the book of Daniel. There are things that are going to be talked about that we'll get to later on um, in the book of Ezekiel. And it deals especially with the restoration of Israel, but we can relate it uh, also to, our, uh, to the end time. So we want to go through both now these Old Testament prophecies uh, on things that have to do with things to come. Uh, we'll move through, we'll go back into the book of Matthew a little bit when it comes to the ten virgins and things like that. There's always some questions there. And then eventually we will certainly spend some time in the book of Revelation. I don't know yet, I haven't determined, we're way too far out for me even to get that far. If we'll take the time and go through the seven churches, or if we'll just go right into the judgments, right? The, the bold judgments and the, um, the different kinds of judgments that are there in the book of Revelation. Um, all of that, and, and I would say in part of that, some of your questions undoubtedly will be answered. Hopefully. Right? And if you come to me with a question, um, I'm probably just going to say, I don't know, I haven't covered it yet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Certainly your questions are welcome. And, uh, you know, I will do my very best to answer them to the best of my ability. Uh, but there's a lot of questions, right? I don't need to re-preach out. A lot of questions concerning things to come right now. A lot, of, a lot of questions on people's hearts and people's minds. The mark of the beast, right? Um, lots of different things going through people's minds. So it's an appropriate time, I felt like. And, and again, as you all prayed about and asked, and uh, asking the Lord what he would have me to teach, this is where we landed. And so I want to go through some of these Old Testament prophecies now that relate to the latter days, to the end times. So that brings us to Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. Now, I only read a small section. I began in verse 26, and I didn't even read down through the interpretation that Daniel gave. And the reason that I'm coming to Daniel chapter 2 first is because in our Baptist circles, right, Sovereign Grace Landmark Missionary Baptist, we know of Daniel being a prophetic book. And a prophetic book basically meaning a book that speaks about the latter days. A book that speaks about the things to come. A book that speaks about the last days. It's a prophetic book. It has prophecy in it. 
And Daniel chapter 2 gives us two very quick instructions for us to know that it is the latter days. I mean, it, it straight says it in verse 28, but there is a God of heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. The dream and the visions of thy head upon the bed are these. And then it says, um, what, shall, what should come to pass. So Daniel begins to do an interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now I originally was just going to go right into verse 26 because that is what is most impactful for our things to come message. That is what is most, you know, relevant, I guess I should say. But um, I, am gonna, I actually am going to go back and I at least want to do an overview of the dream and of what happened, of Daniel's faithfulness, because I really enjoy preaching about the faithfulness of Daniel. I really enjoy the character study of Daniel. And we have gone through, you know, little bits and pieces. Sometimes we'll do Daniel in the Den of Lions. And uh, other times we have done other aspects of Daniel with Belteshat, or I mean with uh, the writing on the wall and all of those different things. So for the purpose of things to come, which, you know, next week, the Lord willing, we will get right into verse 26 because I'm not going to take an overwhelming amount of time in this. Um, that's what is going to be most impactful for us with this series of messages. But again, this was just too great and, and too wonderful to um, gloss over uh, when we get in, you know, as we get into the prophecies of Daniel. So then we'll do some more in Daniel, um, certainly next week in Daniel chapter 2. But then I think I'm going to go over to the ram. Um, I think that's in Daniel chapter 4. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in Daniel. And then the latter books of Daniel uh, really, really have to do with uh, the latter days and things to come. But specifically, as I get started, before I talk about the dream, again, to keep you in relation to things to come, Nebuchadnezzar's dream was a revelation from God concerning what would happen in the latter days. Really what Nebuchadnezzar's dream is, is an overview of Gentile world Dominion, And as I said already, Nebuchadnezzar's dream deals with the future. It deals with certainly things that have already come to pass, but that fourth, right, that legs of iron and feet of part iron and part clay represent that Roman Empire. All of these things um, very, very uh, uh, clearly laid out for us. And we're going to go through those interpretations. And thankfully... I have Brother Terry here, who we have gone through these things before um, in our Sunday school class. So if I get way off beat, which today is the first part, it's just talking about the dream and Daniel being faithful. So I think I'll be square there. Uh, he can straighten all of us out later. I can't do the drawing. I can't be an artist and draw circles and all of that stuff. That's really bothering me. Um, but anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. All right. So again... <laughs> These are the latter days, 28, and then shall come to pass hereafter, 29, and what shall come to pass. These uh, three, all three of these are expressions that emphasize the fact that we must not lose sight of this image as a picture of future things. It is a prophecy, and it deals with things which had not yet happened, but lay in the days ahead, even to the latter days. Again, there's a lot of skepticism that have attacked Daniel again and again and tried to prove that this is not a prophetic book, but it is a prophetic book, and it does deal with future events. Uh, Daniel is very clear on the matter and tells the king that this image of gold, silver, brass, and iron, and clay is a picture of things to come. History has verified the accuracy of all of Daniel's predictions. History has verified the accuracy of Daniel's predictions here. When we get into the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the dream that represents the four successive Gentile powers, right? The first one, the head of gold, that represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylon Empire. The second, the brass and arms of silver represent that Medo-Persian Empire. That's in verse 39. Uh, the verse 39, also the belly and the thighs of brass represent that Greek and that uh, 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 empire of Alexander the Great. Anybody heard of any of these folks so far? Absolutely, you've heard of the Babylonian Empire. You sure have. You've heard of the Medo-Persian Empire. You sure have. You've heard of Alexander the Great. You've heard of it. And then the legs of iron and the feet of part iron and play, that fourth part. Uh, that represent the Roman Empire and the revealed Roman Empire in verses 40 through 43. History bears out the fact that these things in Nebuchadnezzar's dream started to and will continue to come.
to pass. All right. Um, so more to come on that. But let's go back a little ways uh, before we get into that verse 26. And again, um, you know, not to spend, you know, just tons and tons of time on this, but to go back a little ways. Um, we see this great deal. We see this great deal of history and some revealing of a dream that the king had uh, that relates to things to come. Except for Daniel chapter 7, which we'll get there, right? Um, we'll definitely be going through Daniel chapter 7. So except for Daniel chapter 7, to me, there's not a more comprehensive picture of world history that is given that we see here, that we would see that is here in chapter 2. All of those empires that I mentioned that you already have heard of, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the, the empire of Alexander the Great, the Grecians, and the Roman Empire, you've heard of all of those empires. What a complete picture. And then the stone breaking them. Oh, I didn't even talk about that yet, did I? We read about it. Yeah. The Bible here records numerous incidents where God imparted dreams and visions to show His will and to show the future. Sometimes the intent and the interpretation of the dream is immediate, and sometimes it's foretelling of what's going to happen in the future. So we look very quickly as we get into this here, verses 1 and 2 of Daniel chapter 2. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show thee the interpretation. And the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. That's pretty stout as we get started there, right? So the king had a dream. He had a dream that troubled him. He had a dream that woke him up from his sleep. And so Daniel records this as the second year of the king's reign. Now we know, well, we can know from chapter 1 that the boys were in training for three years. And, uh, and then in this third year, this king uh, had a dream. The king clearly had to receive this dream from God. And he had forgotten it. He wanted it to be revealed. As we read, the Chaldeans, acting as a spokesman, were a group, and they were addressing the king. The phrase, Syriac is Aramaic. So the text here through chapter 7 and verse 28 is written in this Aramaic form. Um, the wise men, they wanted to hear the dream. This dream that Daniel is going to interpret this dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, that is significant for us as we study the end times. And so they come in front of the king and they say, Oh, king, live forever. They were very respectful for the king and they just, they said, King, if you just tell us the dream first, just tell us the dream and we'll be happy to interpret it for you. And the king said, Nah. -uh. Well, he didn't say, Nah. -uh. We didn't read the words, Nah. -uh. But in so many words, the king was like, No. I have, the, that is, that, the dream has left me. You tell me the dream and you tell me the interpretation thereof. Now, I didn't read it yet, but the Chaldeans are about to freak out. How can we know your dreams? We can't know your dreams. We can't know them. But if you would just tell us again first, we can interpret it for you. Now, the king already said he was not going to do that. He said, if they can't figure this out, he's going to have them cut in pieces. So, you know, I said maybe it was, this is significant. And knowing the interpretation and how the dream came to pass because of the character of Daniel and who Daniel was. It is good for us that God left us for or left this for us in his word. Alright, so he wanted that dream uh, to be, you know, told to him and for them to know it and then give the interpretation. He told him he could but he told he also told them in verse six, but if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you receive gifts. You shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Now, again, <laughs> the king repeated it again, verses 7 through 9, so I won't reread those. I already gave you that summary. He repeated. <laughs> and then the wise men asked one more time in verse 10. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, lord, no ruler that ask it, 
ask such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king require it, that there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause, the king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Pretty serious. They tried three times to convince the king that this was not a possible thing. They're like, no other king has ever asked this. Now why, I don't know why these astrologers didn't just, you know, make up something when the king already said, I don't remember what the dream was, it has left me. They probably could have got away with making something up, but they didn't, right? Three times. No king has ever asked this. No one is able to do this. Now, I don't know if you meant, or if you, if you caught on to this, not only did they ask, and the king was not going to do it, he became angry with them, that he then required that all the wise men be destroyed. So much so, that even the one that I am preaching about now, who interpreted the dream, was also to be slain. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Could you imagine? Now this great prophetic book, the book of Daniel, because of the king's anger and the king's wrath. You see, beloved, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, I want you to know God is sovereign in all things. Amen? Daniel ended up not being slain, obviously, because we have this book. <laughs> But, if it were up to the king, he would have been. Right? And these astrologers and these magicians and all these guys that were so confused, we don't know what to do, the king, we don't know, you can't ask this of us. And the king's like, that's it. You're done. You and all the other wise men, you're done. They sought to slay Daniel and his fellows. So what's Daniel going to do? What's Daniel going to do when he comes before the king? This very important dream that relates to things to come, what's going to happen when Daniel comes forward? All right. So, verses 14 through 16. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made known the thing to Daniel. Daniel's like, I, what is going on? You know, we're, we're in training, and next thing I know, you're coming out to kill all of us. What happened? And so he told Daniel. I'm sure he told Daniel that King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that he called for the, the astrologers and all the soothsayers and the Chaldeans to make known. They couldn't make known the dream and the interpretation thereof. And so I'm sure he told that to Daniel. Okay? Verse 16. Then Daniel went in and desired the king. Can you imagine? I mean, there's some boldness. Now, Daniel wasn't, it's not as if Daniel was old like I am in his 40s, right? No, Daniel's still a young man. Daniel is still in some of this training. And Daniel, you know, hairs of this decree. But Daniel's faith is in God, folks. And there's no other way for me to describe it other than that. Because the decree, and you know from other passages of Scripture and other accounts of the Bible that have preached and taught and that you've heard your whole life, right? When a decree is made, the king it just, just changes his mind, okay? Especially when it's sealed with a signet. And here's Daniel about to approach the very king that wanted him to be destroyed. I just, it's, it's phenomenal. The providence and the sovereignty of God for us then to know this dream, right? So then Daniel went into his house. Oh, I'm sorry. Then Daniel went in and desired, verse 16, of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Hmm. Then Daniel went into his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, here's what's going on. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, guys. Let's pray about this and pray that God would reveal us the dream and the interpretation. And I can preach that out about the, you know, again, you know, receiving counsel from those and all other things and getting people to, to pray and our importance to pray, right? Daniel realized the importance of prayer and he prayed earnestly to God about the matter. 
Daniel told his three companions, and they prayed with him in this matter. Uh, Daniel was not a proud boaster of any kind. Um, you know, it takes a lot of patience to pray when you're so motivated not to die. Right? How could his mind not be distracted on, if I don't get this, I'm going to be killed. You know, if I don't get this, my companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are going to be killed, all the wise men. And really, again, that just shows you the rashness and anger of kings, right? Kings rely on their counsel. They rely on wise men. They rely on people to give them things um, and tell them things, what's going on in the provinces. But, you know, just in the moment there, he's like, ah, off with their heads. And I, again, I'm paraphrasing. He, he cut off their parts. I know he said that, so a head is a part. So, nevertheless, he, he doesn't think it through. Just like he didn't think it through when he wanted the furnace to be warm seven times hotter, but that's another story. So anyway, Daniel went to pray. It's important to go and pray. It's important to go and pray. Um, Daniel and his friends, they didn't believe in the Babylonian gods. Um, Daniel's god was the god of heavens. Or the god of, of heaven. Um, Daniel was going to pray. And so he went and he prayed. So beloved, may we remember to go before our wonderful Almighty God and go to Him in prayer. And they went and they prayed. Okay, there we go. So then, Daniel went, okay, verse 19. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. And He changeth the times and seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knoweth and knowledge to them that know understanding. What a beautiful thing that Daniel is already saying about God. I mean, just Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God. How many times have we got up from prayer and just blessed the name of God? Just bless God for who He is and what He has done. Bless Him forever and ever for wisdom and might are His. Blessed be the God of heaven. And then it talks about the things that do change, right? We talked about today, yes, yeah, seasons change, temperatures change, kings and rulers change, but God does not change. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness and in the light, and, in, and the light dwelleth in Him. I thank Thee and praise Thee, O God, Oh, I'm sorry. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and hath made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Can you imagine? God has revealed and made known unto Daniel what was the king's matter. They now know. Therefore Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the interpretation. And Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. Then, where we started reading, the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Next week, the Lord willing, we will get into Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But I wanted to give you that background and context to the sovereignty of God that we came to the place that we can learn of this dream that relates also to the latter days. May God use His word. Maybe you got a little something out of that. I trust that you did. May God use His word and add the blessing to it. Shall we stand together and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer.